Isn't everything silent in space, as Alien told us years ago? In space, no one can hear you scream. How can we talk about the sound of the Big Bang if there's nothing there for the Big Bang to make a sound in? In the very early days of the universe, what you have is instead of having a uniform, a perfectly uniform distribution, quantum mechanics tells us we can't have that perfect uniform distribution. Therefore, you have fluctuations. And those tiny, tiny fluctuations, it's like a lumpiness of the soup. For there to even be sound, what you need are pressure variations. And those pre how are those pressure variations set up? Right at the start, what you have is this soup, this plasma, electrons, quarks. We haven't even got atoms. About 400,000, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, what happens is that everything cools down sufficiently so that atoms can start forming. Before that, the issue is actually you can't see through the universe because you've got this dense fog, this plasma. Tiny, tiny quantum fluctuations right at the start get blown up very, very rapidly. And those tiny fluctuations, what they do is they imprint pressure variations across the early universe. And when we look and see the cosmic microwave background, it's telling us about those pressure fluctuations. And pressure fluctuations tell us about sound. So you could say that actually everything that there is, the entire universe, the matter around us, arises due to sound, arises due to pressure fluctuations. And what happens in the Big Bang, at least in the early stages, is that that moment, that instant, is you don't have those pressure variations. Everything's moving out radially at the same rate. Actually, it was silent, which seems really, why would we call it the Big Bang if it's silent? Why would it be silent? Well, the important thing is to really have sound. Well, what is sound? Sound is a, a variation in pressure. Those fluctuations, those pressure variations, kicked in rather later on, a little bit further down the line from the Big Bang. So the Big Bang itself, it's probably best not to call it the Big Bang, it's probably best to call it something like a big light rather than a Big Bang. The density of the universe in terms of the matter in the universe was a million times greater, a million times greater than it is now. So the best way to think about the universe at that point in time is that it's all atmosphere. It's all just, it's, it's all air, effectively. It's all atmosphere. We know today that sound can't travel through space. Why can't sound tr travel through space? Simply because the density of the atoms isn't high enough to allow those sound waves to propagate. But right at the, those early stages, the density was beyond high enough for um, sound waves to travel across the universe. So it's much the same as you have standing waves and then you have harmonics on a guitar string. That's the way you've got to think about it. Uh, in terms of certain patches of space will have a higher density, certain other patches of space will have a lower density. So it's clumped together here and then falls away and then you have regions where there's a lower density and then you can think of having one harmonic, having higher harmonics in terms of how that matter is distributed. I don't see how this has anything to do with sound. But what is sound? So again, if we think about a guitar string, when you pluck that guitar string, you get a standing wave set up on that. What's happening is that you're getting, that string is moving back and forth. It's moving air molecules back and forth and they're hitting your, your ears. What's happening there? It's a hang pressure. On, hang on, hang on. There you go. You've started something propagating. It's not the guitar string that is sound. It's the propagation of the air being pushed by the guitar string. It is, yes. But if what we can do is we can interpret that that pattern that we see, we can interpret those harmonics in terms of, well, what is, what is happening is that the density is being pushed around. The, the density, the, the, the matter is being pushed around and you're getting variations in density. If you're getting variations in density, that means you're getting variations in pressure. That is sound. That is sound. So there is stuff moving. There is stuff, there is stuff moving, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but again, the best way, so why do we call it a standing wave on a guitar string? Because it's, it's a, a wave that although the string is moving up and down, where is the maximum? It's always located at the right point. If we talk about the first harmonic, it's right at the center of the string. A human ear wouldn't but, hear it. Like, what kind of listening device? So the, the problem is, is that we're talking about frequencies. So if we pluck a guitar string, I don't know, we're talking about frequencies of tens of hertz to hundreds of hertz. We're talking about periods of a few seconds, a few tenths of seconds, a few you know, hundredths of a second. When it comes to the Big Bang, we're talking about 10 to the minus 12 hertz, or 10 to the minus 13 hertz. Or a better way of thinking about that is 50 octaves lower than when you pluck a guitar string. So, you know, you listen to a guitar string, you know that that's oscillating back and forth pretty rapidly. If it were the Big Bang, and we were thinking about the oscillations for the Big Bang, then that string is moving up and down. It's taking 20,000 to 200,000 years to do one oscillation. That's what we're talking about. So that's not just heavy. 
That's not just subsonic. That's sub 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 song sonic. That's that's completely outside the realm of any type of human perception. Phil, I always think of the Big Bang as a time of incredible energy and velocity and violence. And yet you're talking to me about things that are moving at these subglacial speeds. Absolutely, it's it's bizarre, isn't it? It's the language we use. Another example of where we use language in physics and we borrow everyday terms which don't quite capture. Does it have a note? Is it like a B flat? Oh, that's so you can in principle work out where that note is, but the problem is that the when you look at the spectrum, instead of having very nice peaks, frequency peaks as you have with a, a guitar string, where you can say, you know, it's B flat or whatever. The problem is with the with the Big Bang, when you look at the spectrum of the Big Bang, actually those peaks are very broad. Which means that the, the note isn't isn't a well-defined musical note, it's much more, uh, much broader and much less distinct, much more indistinct. Actually, I'm borrowing an awful lot of this from a guy called Mark Whittle at the University of Virginia. He's got a wonderful, wonderful website where he describes the, what he calls Big Bang Acoustics. Others have, have looked at this as well. And if you go to his website, then you can actually find um, WAV files, um, sounds, where he's taken this spectrum, transposed it to um, up to 50 octaves to where we could, where it's within the range of human hearing and you can listen to a um, wide range of different um, aspects of the sounds of the Big Bang. Would dogs hear the Big Bang? Uh, dogs wouldn't hear the Big Bang, not unless they lived to be 200,000 years old. <laughs> you look at the cosmic microwave background, that's telling you about temperature variations, but those temperature variations, as we said, also tell you about density variations. And those density variations, in turn, will tell you about pressure variations. And once you've got pressure variations, then you can work out how many decibels the Big Bang was. What we have is something called a bell. What a bell is, is a measure of the relative loudness, let's put it that way, I'm being a bit loose with words, relative loudness of, of two signals. And the way that's defined is a bell is log, to the base 10, so it's a logarithmic measure, and the reason we do that is because our ears work logarithmically. And what you have is, let's say, two signals, P2 and P1. And this is the power signal 2, and this is the power signal 1. What we need is a reference, and let's use slightly unusual subscripts here. So let's have a loud signal, which we're going to denote with that subscript. And let's have a quiet signal, and we're going to denote that with that subscript. Now this quiet signal is our reference signal. That's taken to generally to be the limit of human hearing. Now we can quibble about what that is and there's a lot of quibbling about that, but that's defined in terms of a certain pressure which represents the limit of human hearing. That's a bell. However, what you find is it's better to work in decibels just in terms of the magnitude of the numbers involved. So decibel we define slightly differently like this, but it's exactly the same idea. That's in terms of the power of the signal. This is a subtle point and a technical point, but I'm going to put it in there because otherwise I know the whole comments section will erupt. So what we'll do now is going to convert this from a power to a pressure. And those are related, one is the square of the other, so that gives us a factor of two when it comes to the logs. And what we end up for our final formula is something that looks like this. dB is 20 log, where this is our loud signal and this is our quiet signal. If I can fit it all on the page. So normally, in air, what we'd do is we'd look at the limit of human hearing in air and think about what the pressure is associated with that and then we think about what the pressure is associated with how I'm speaking here. Ratio the two, get the log, multiply by 20, that gives you decibels. To give you an idea of what sort of high end of decibels might be, if you're standing about, I don't know, 20 or 30 meters from a jet engine, record the sound coming from the engine, I can convert that to a pressure scale. Then if I take that pressure reading from the, um, the jet engine, compare it to the pressure associated with the absolute limit of human hearing, get that as a logarithm to the base 10, multiply by 20, that gives me about 140 decibels. That's 140 decibels is, as I say, quite noisy and getting to the limit of human hearing. Turns out that the loudest rock band, loudest heavy metal band on the planet, it's a band called Manowar, which some of you might be familiar with. If you're not familiar with Manowar, go look them up. Hours of endless fun. You know, Brady, I can see you nodding your head, you know I had to get a heavy metal reference in somewhere. They lay a claim at 139 dB to be the loudest band on the planet. The 
couldn't quite beat a jet engine. They couldn't quite beat a jet engine, but that's pretty good. But actually, if you stand just a little bit back from the jet engine, it falls off as the inverse square. So, yeah. so <laughs> depending on where you are with the jet engine, Man of War could be louder. <laughs> So, Man of War 139 dB, let's round that up, as all good physicists do, and call that 140 dB, but about the same uh, level in terms of dB as a jet engine. Now, you might think, well, this is the Big Bang. The Big Bang's just going to be billions of dB. Actually, you look at those pressure fluctuations, you do exactly what we're doing here. Of course, your reference level can't be within the soup right at the start of the universe. It can't be the limit of human hearing. But what you can do is you can get the average pressure um, from the from the pattern from the cosmic microwave background and then look at the fluctuations about that If you look at the fluctuations in pressure Well, actually all you want to do is you have a reference level and then you're looking at the variation about that reference level That's what you're doing when you think about the jet engine So obviously we can't send a human back and also it's you know happening on a ridiculously long time scales So we need something artificial so we could set up a robot We'd have to get the time machine sorted out though Brady That's the first thing and I've been working on that for quite some time now, and it doesn't seem to be going any, <laughs> anywhere fast. But let's say we get the time machine worked out. So we can send this robot back 13.8 billion years or so. And then what we need to do is we'd have to set it up with an artificial ear, and that artificial ear would have to be tolerant of fairly extreme environments, but we could set it up so its reference level would be whatever the, the, the baseline pressure is. And then we'd look at, we'd tra it would know, or they would be programmed to look at fluctuations about that baseline level. Not look, here. Thank you, here. We know the fluctuations. We know the level of the fluctuations. Remember, all we want is a ratio. So if we know those fluctuations are at the level of 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7, you know, one part in a million, one part in 10 million, one part in 100 million, whatever, that's, that's all we need to get uh, a dB value. With the Big Bang, well, it's, it's the origin of everyone. Wouldn't that just absolutely blow your head off wouldn't the volume just be could you exist you know would it not just those sound waves just completely rupt you turns out it's not as loud as we think it is so the number when we work this through we look at the decibels and we look at this these variations in pressure turns out about 120 decibels that's all so not only is a jet engine louder than the big bang man of war is much 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 louder than the than, than the big bang our robot would come out and say, it wasn't that loud. It wasn't Indeed. It wasn't as bad as that Man of War concert. Exactly. Hi everyone, if you enjoyed that video, then you're definitely going to enjoy this. It's a new book by Phil Moriarty, who you've just been watching. It's called, When the Uncertainty Principle Goes to Eleven, or How to Explain Quantum Physics with Heavy Metal. In fact, the video you just watched is partly based on a very small section of this book. I've been reading it, it's really good fun. It's written like Phil speaks, it's enthusiastic, it's funny. I've really been enjoying it. I especially enjoy all the footnotes. Phil puts lots of jokes and unnecessary detail in the footnotes. It's almost as fun as the book itself. And another reason you should check this out is the illustrations, all the artwork in it were done by Pete McPartlin, who animates loads of the videos on 60 Symbols and Number File, including the one you just watched. I'm really, really happy for Phil and Pete. They've made a really great thing. And if you want to show them just a little bit of thanks for all the time they've given us in these videos over the years, consider this one. When the uncertainty principle goes to 11, I'll put links down in the description, or you can just pick it up at your bookstore. Just look for that. It's coming out really, really soon. You can't miss that cover, can you? This is what it looks like when Phil holds it. Smile. He's almost as bad as me, isn't he? <laughs>